Hello out there in the YouTube universe. It is Thursday. 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 And there is a new magic set on the horizon. It is called Heim, and we are here to talk about it. The only way we know how to talk about it, commons only. Commons only. That's it. We don't care about the rest. I don't even know what those other colors are. I've never even heard of that weird, it's weird color. That other color that's kind of yellowy, and then that other color that's now like kind of pink. It, I don't know is it pink or mean. orange? I don't, I, don't I don't know. I don't look at it. doesn't matter. I don't open those in packs. I'll tell you that much. If you watch our limited content, you know that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so That's we true. are here to talk about the commons coming out of Kaldheim, both in a pauper sense, a traditional, regular old, good old, eternal pauper. Yes. As well as historic arena pauper, because that seems to be the pauper they favor now on arena in general, the old historic pauper, which I do too, because more cards the yeah. better for a format like pauper. Absolutely, especially since we're players of eternal pauper, which is what I'm calling it. Um, yeah. You know, the limited, the standard pauper was like, uh, there's four decks and they all take 20 years to play. Mm hmm. And then there's yep. red that doesn't win. Yep. So. <laughs> No, I, I agree. But hopefully we can help help you cobble together some decks that will get you some amount of victories, or at least in the case of it's, uh, Eternal Pauper, Pauper Pauper, whatever you want to call it, uh, at least some cards that may see play in the format, it's a lot harder to encroach upon. Yeah, breaking into the format as a common is not easy. No. No. A lot of good commons, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. There's a reason they call it Legacy Light. Mm-hmm. So we'll start off with Pauper Pauper, Eternal Pauper, and then we'll move in. So to for Eternal Pauper, we're going to keep it pretty brief because there are plenty of places and plenty of people who are far more accomplished at the format than we are who you can talk about, listen to, watch, read, speak on the topic a little bit more knowledgeably than us. But we play plenty of Pauper. I'm constantly up in the Pauper. So... I think that a lot of these aren't going to surprise anybody, but I think that these are the cards that are going to be some of the better ones to choose from. All right, yeah, so just going through the list that Max gave me right before we started, uh, we're going to start with Behold the Multiverse. Yeah, Behold the Multiverse is an instant for four, three and a blue. It allows you to scry two, then draw two cards. Overall, not very exciting. Four mana is a ton in Pauper, and to simply scry two, draw two... Uh, we get a we get a scry two draw one on preordain for a single blue. Um, the thing that makes this card more interesting is it has an ability that's new to the set called foretell, which allows you to during your turn you can pay two colorless mana or two generic mana mm -hmm. and exile it from your hand face down, and then you can cast it on a later turn for its foretell cost, and its foretell cost happens to be one and a blue. Much more reasonable for the spell. Actually, yeah, for the spell. And I think part of foretell when you're evaluating foretell because it's new, one of the things you have to evaluate in it is how much is the foretell cost, mm -hmm. how much is giving this information away, and is that enough savings that it's worth two mana on an earlier turn? Right. I think for behold the multiverse, it definitely is a good candidate because it doesn't have a strong cost in terms of showing it to your opponent yeah. like this is a, like what are you gonna like what you're going to draw with it is more valuable information than simply i have a card draw spell at some point when i have two open mana at instant speed exactly and i think foretell could have huge implications in every format um mm -hmm. pauper is a great example for this because it's a way to like discard proof your hand um it makes your hand size almost infinite you just have to pay for it a little bit but mm -hmm. you can just keep putting things aside and you only have to keep track of the order in which you do it and to make sure you don't try to play something the same turn you foretell it that's yeah it. everything else is like this is making like it on turn seven i'm gonna have a hand of like six cards in my hand and three foretell cards that's the kind of card advantage and card like equity that is really hard to overcome for a lot of decks, especially if you're playing against a control deck that just has infinite options. 
Right, and that's and you nailed it. And this is the thing that makes Behold the Multiverse good is it allows you to compete with a deck like Tron, where it can build such an overwhelming advantage you can't keep up in terms of cards, because uh, of things like Bonders Ornament. But this actually lets you kind of deal in that world if you're playing something a little bit more aggressive or tempo oriented than Tron is. Mm -hmm. So it actually gives you a shot for cheap. Because I mean, like you, the nice thing is if you just simply pay the foretell cost, you pay two. And you put it, you put it down in exile. It doesn't have to be all. It's not like miracle where you have to reveal it off the top of your deck at a certain point, or there's a weird trigger condition to yeah. it. It's just simply at some point you have two extra mana. Cool, put this card aside, and then later you can use it. And that becomes very valuable. Like you said, there are definite matchups like mono black, and you know things where it's just like this is way better sitting in exile when I need it when I have the mana to go off and multi spell in one turn. That becomes way better. So I think behold the multiverse flexible enough that i think there's going to be a couple decks that want it in pauper pauper and obviously it's going to be very very good in arena pauper and we'll get to that in a little bit yeah all the cards that we go over are going to be great in arena pauper because if they can break into the eternal format of pauper it's a pretty great card so yep mm -hmm. i think that kind of goes without saying but i'll say it yeah. anyway right all right so next up is bind the monster Bind the ah, Monster cool. is pretty much everybody's general consensus of the best potential pauper card coming into the format. Yeah. Oh, it's real it's good. Cool. It's real good. It's single blue mana for an aura that when it enters the battlefield, you tap the enchanted creature. It de The creature deals damage equal to you, who's the one who cast the Bind the Monster, equal to its power. And it does not untap during its controller's untap step. Yeah. So... This is a dehydration effect. If you're familiar with the card dehydration, dehydration costs four. This costs a single blue. The drawback is merely that one time the creature is going to tag you for its power. Yeah, and that for a single mana, it like the trade off is wonderful. Like, is capture sphere a common? Capture sphere is a common. So I mean, that's an analogy that is in arena right now, and yeah. you know, people play that almost every time they draft it, because it's great removal. This might yep. not have flash, but it costs three less. So it's so yeah. good. And yeah. the idea that you can tap down like a mana dork and only take one and just shut down land is also kind of enticing. Yeah, it's it's awesome. It's got the like unquenchable thirst without the needing a desert. Mm -hmm. It's got um, the same abilities as a lot of these dehydrations. Generally, they won't tap a cruise like Bubble Snare very recently. You have to pay extra. You have to pay a pretty high kicker in order to... I think it's a three kicker. It turns it into dehydration to yeah. tap the creature. Tap the this creature one's just creature. always a single blue. That's crazy good removal for blue. A yeah. color that generally does not get good removal. Absolutely. So I know a lot of pauper stalwarts are upset because the new one of the new cards that is potentially good in the format is another blue enchantment right after they just banned Fall from Favor because that was too good a blue enchantment. Uh, cheap Monarch is just too good. Too good. Too good. Way too... And removal on top of it. So, yeah, I'm going to remove your best creature, which clearly impacts the Monarch race, and I'm going to become the Monarch, by the way. Best of luck. Yeah. Poof. No thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so buying the monster, I think, is the real deal, and obviously we'll talk about it in Arena Pauper in a minute. Yep. Next up is Masked Vandal. This is What's my that? personal favorite card coming out of Call Time for Pauper. Yeah. Uh, this... I love this card so much. It's It's got one of your favorite abilities on it. Changeling is one of my favorite things that is on a magic card, and I don't know why. I mean, uh, beside the fact that I love playing tribal decks in multiple formats, um, it's just, this card is actually just amazing, because I love built-in ways to get rid of artifacts and enchantments that doesn't necessarily slow down your deck too much. And if you're playing a slower deck in general, a 1-3 for 2 that triggers any kind of specific creature thing is always going to be useful. And this can also just tag down a mana rock or, you know, a pesky enchantment that's getting in the way. Like, you it's, know, the binding that we just said, and I forgot the name of already. Bind the monster. Bind the monster. I could just go back to it, but I didn't. Yeah. No, this card is really good. Um, I think there's a bit of a drawback there. We have to exile a creature card from your graveyard. Yeah, so you have to have creatures going to the graveyard. Additional costs, but... But I'm personally excited for it because of the Tortured Existence deck. 
where it's just yeah. intending to dump a ton of creatures into its graveyard anyway, and being able to exile the artifact or enchantment is a nice, a really nice touch. Not that there's a whole lot of ways to interact with that in Pauper, Not but really. there are some. Yeah. Um, anything that can, I mean, there's some, it's more in Arena Pauper, you see like uh, some, some escape cards that are enchantments and things, but being able to just be like, that is gone and it's gone, gone. Gone, gone. Is a really nice touch. And the fact that it has a decent stat line at a good cost, it's yeah. all really, really nice. Very easy to recur in a deck like Tortured Existence. It fits into an elf deck in the sideboard if it needs to. Elves are going to have creatures mowed through pretty fast. So mm-hmm. it just comes down. It deals with a pesky art. It's something that will let them turn the game over. Game over. Obviously, one of the most stark examples being like a Bonder's Ornament or a Pristine Talisman. Yeah. Those are both really good. This destroys a Pestilence. It does a lot of work in the format for a mid range style deck, like aristocrats, elves, well, this is more of a combo deck, but Most tortured true. existence, these kind of grindy mid rangey value decks really like this card because it does exactly what they need. It comes in and hits key cards that are causing all sorts of problems. So I think mass vandal is pretty awesome. Like I almost want it for Zubaris. Like I, might, Zubaris. I might have it on the sideboard in favor of like the naturalizes I put on there just cause um, I was just, Trying to put the basics in there. Yep. But this is a little, a little choice. above rate for that kind of effect. So Totally agree. Next up is Skull Raid. Skull Raid is an interesting one. It is three and black for a sorcery. Target opponent discards two cards. Oh okay, God. so it's an expensive mind rot so far. Uh-huh. If fewer than two cards were discarded this way, you draw cards equal to the difference. Max, what's so, one of the worst things about drawing a discard spell late in the game? It does nothing. They have no cards in hand. No cards in hand. You know, uh, this one gets around that quite nicely, but uh, at four, it's still way too expensive. It is. But Max, However, there's more. <laughs> there is. There's a whole half of the card here uh, in Foretell. It, it foretells for one and a black. Yeah. Pay two, and then next turn, pay two, pay two again. Yep. So in theory, it, you could do this to them on turn three, or you could just do it on like turn seven and draw two cards for... Two mana, and then two mana. Yeah, it's the implications of this card can be pretty gnarly because it's good. What makes it interesting to me is it's one of the few discard style cards we've seen that feels really good in the main board. Yeah, like normally it has to be like a targeted piece of removal, like duress or something like that. It's like I want to look at your hand and get information that way and do an additional thing. And even duress is generally relegated to sideboards. Uh, Black will play some discard and some pseudo discard in a card like Chittering Rats. Um, Skull Raid is just so good because if your opponent has no cards in hand, it's like, oh, okay, great, then I'll just draw two. Yeah. You can hold it for when your opponent's sitting on the right number of cards because they're at their best when you have to force your opponent. They don't get to pick, right? Like they have two cards in hand. I want them to get rid of both of those cards. Yeah. That's when your cards are the best, and you can wait for that turn to come up. Now they get the advantage of they can play around it. So the cost of information on this card is a little bit higher. But if they attempt to play around it, the most common way to play around discard is to dump your hand. And we were talking about that earlier with Fortel. Yep. So you're just like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll draw more cards then. It's cool. Man, go ahead, dump your hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay two in a little bit and just draw two cards. Yeah. yeah That's called Night's Whisper with no downside. Yeah. I don't. I don't think there's a ton of decks that want this card for sure, but I think there are decks that are definitely going to be interested in playing with this card to see how it does. Yeah, like the the non-targetedness of it makes it not as good for a lot of combo decks, but there could just be like a hard Demir control deck that's just like, I want to just keep draining your resources and go from there. Yep, totally. All right, so here's the final Stalwart Valkyrie. Yeah, Stalwart Valkyrie is what a lot of people were hearkening to what could be the, air quotes, new Delver. Um, I don't think it's that good. <laughs> it's got the same stats, though, Max. It does have the same stats as a flip Delver. But, yeah, the, the cost is a bit higher and might not always trigger. Right. It's so. three and a white for a 3-2 flyer. It has the ability of you may pay one and a white and exile a card from your a creature card from your graveyard rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Yep. So it's similar to Mask Vandal in that you're paying for the cheaper cost of this 
by exiling stuff out of your yard, which you might not always have. Right. And that's the co- the cost is you have to generally play a higher creature count, mm-hmm. where in Pauper, the power generally comes from non-creature spells. Most of the top tier decks generally lean on non-creature spells to do most of the heavy lifting, and creatures are generally just clean up or value. Yeah. Uh, generally like blink targets, but the power comes from something like a ghostly flicker or an ephemerate. That's more the power of Pauper than simply a 3-2 flyer. So you have to play a higher creature count. You also have to play ways to discard cards. Yeah. Which is always easy to do like you're not necessarily just jamming faithless looting into all your pauper decks so there is a cost in there and all your creatures aren't dying super quick either it's hard to put down a one mana creature that pressures your opponent enough they're gonna be like i'm gonna use my removal spell right now on that yeah so you have to be doing something to get a creature in the yard so the so this is more like a value like this is gonna be your second or third spell you cast in a turn to try to take over, to stop your opponent's momentum, or gain the board advantage fast enough and hard enough that you can win from there. Yeah. Like we saw Bone Picker, a lot of people got hyped when Bone Picker got downshifted to common, and Bone Shifter gets some play here and there in a couple decks, a not bit. too, too many. Um, but this stalwart Valkyrie feels like it's going to be more of a Bone Picker than a Delver. Delver's cost to, to play is just so low. Yeah, because it relies it, on the, the non-creature spells that you're already wanting to play. Right, the best cantrips in the format out of blue. So it's just like, sure, I jammed a creature in there that goes perfectly with them. Stalwart Valkyrie is a little bit harder to use than that, but its stat line is hard to ignore, and the fact that you can cast it as like, I'm going to cast this like a little creature and then you know some random two-drop or one-drop, and then the Valkyrie. It's like, okay, my opponent's board state's now insane. Like, I just got done clearing their big threat, so now they all of a sudden have created a crazy board. So, it's got implications, no doubt. Yeah, for sure. So, I think those are those along with the, we haven't mentioned them yet, the, the cycle of Snowlands. Yeah, the Snow Duels. I mean, that kind of goes without saying, but they're dual lands at common. Like, I mean, there's, there's, no, no there's no real way to fetch them except for, like, Farseek or Wood Elves kind mm-hmm. of thing. But... For the most part, they're just in there as easier ways to fix, and the snow decks that you scred are going to love it. Yeah, I think scred gets a big boost from having these if they want to splash into another color. We saw a lot of the yeah. the scred, the multicolored scred decks when Arkham's Astrolabe was around. So mm-hmm. I think there's definitely a, a high level chance that these get played. There's also the one that comes in tapped and then taps to add any color. Yeah. Where you choose a color and then it taps to add that you color. Cho- you choose a color, yeah. I will, yeah, I will say, like, based on when they start design on these, their intention was to have Astrolabe and those Snowlands in Pauper at the same time. Yep, absolutely. So, so that's... Kind of glad that didn't happen, but oh man. I loved Astrolabe. I think I was one of the very few people who was just like, I love that. It's great. I, Only like four I, color decks in Pauper. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to in Zubat. I know. I didn't get a chance before. I was like, nah, but... Yep, nope, Banhammer. So. This card's too good. <laughs> but I'm also one of the few people that plays a weird, fair Zubera deck. Not the weird combo, but... Not the Zubera Storm deck, yeah. I digress. <laughs> uh, but yeah, onto Arena, where Zuberas don't Pauper. exist. Yeah. Uh. So I I think one of the things to mention, um, kind of looking back at the cards we just looked at, yeah. um, and it's going to come up thematically as we move through the cards, so I might as well mention it now. Um, the deck that gets a huge boost and a deck I think that really needed it is Demir Control. Yes. For Historic Pauper. Considering, this... like, it was two blue cards and a black card. Yeah. And they're really good. They're really flexible. They really help the deck. I don't know how cl- how many Fortel cards you're allowed to play in a deck. Like, I don't know how many copies of uh, Behold the Multiverse and Skull, and Skull Raid that these decks are going to want. But there's going to be a number, and it's going to be tested, I think, mm-hmm. and... They get so many cheap interactive spells, and we're going to see more of them as we move through. So I think uh, they think that Demir Control definitely coming out one of the big winners for Historic Pauper because it was a deck that was like right. If you're not familiar with Historic Pauper, you get the red, the aggro red deck is huge, like the Kiln mm-hmm. Fiend style red deck um, that plays Thermo Alchemist now. It deck's very very good yeah. in Arena Pauper. Uh, Ancestral good. Mask is a great deck in the format. And you also have the uh, like the hexproof style decks. We want to call them that. The pants style decks. Those are what I consider to be the ancestral mask yeah. decks. Those are all really good in the format. And you get 
some mix of other stuff. Like there's Bono Black Control, there's Demir Control, there is some other variants of Hexproof. Maybe not Hexproof, but just like the pants style deck with um the thing that makes ours cheaper. And yeah. there's some stuff in there that like different things, but I'd say this kind of the pillars of the format of the red aggro decks and the ancestral mask decks. They're kind of always pervasive through the decks. You'll see like Rat Colony, of course, and yeah. things will crop up that are like, oh man, this is really good. But I think those decks are kind of if you if your deck can't compete with those decks, then your deck needs to be reevaluated because those decks are so good. Yeah. So I think that uh, it's worth mentioning based on the cards we talked about. A lot of them go into Demir decks. <laughs> yeah, they do. So definitely worth a mention. All right. So going to the next, which is more just for this format uh, the, of Arena Pulper. And go yep. start with Snakeskin Veil. Yeah, this card is an, an instant. It's a single green. You put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. Not that great. But it also gains Hexproof until end of turn. Yeah, so I think Ranger's Guile was fringe playable in Arena Pauper. Yep. And I think this this definitely uh, got a lot of potential. Like The mono green deck's not a lot, but they could be out there. Are probably going to want this. I think the the reason it made my list is because of the ancestral mask decks. Yeah. Um. I think generally the way I play ancestral mask is I play, um, uh, the elf that draws a card when it comes into play. Elvish visionary. Elvish visionary. The other one that has both the names together has now completely ruined me for elf names. Yeah. Lenore visionary, right? Yeah. Lenore, <laughs> Lenore elves. Elvish Visionary, and then Lanor Visionary. It's like, no, you've ruined all of them now. Or Elvish Elves. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, swear, that's the next one. That's the uncard. <laughs> it is. It better be. Um, so you play cards like that. Uh, I also play Ginger Brute Mine, which if you haven't fiddled with, give that a Ooh. shot because it's very good. That's fun. Um, but Snakes and Ve- Snakeskin Veil can protect those creatures in a key turn when your opponent has a removal spell for them. So I think for those style of decks, or any deck where your creature's your engine, I don't think Kiln Fiend really plays green. I don't think it really has any interest in playing green. No. <laughs> We're well, more likely to play blue and play dive down. But who knows, right? Maybe it's worth experimenting. Maybe I mean, there's a green, red Kiln Fiend yeah, deck. Yeah, maybe there's a gruel deck that just... Because there's pump spells. That's yeah, one really. of the big parts of a red of a Kiln Fiend deck. So. Yeah. Give it, yep, give not it hard to get a trample. trample yep. <laughs> and you're good to go. Get them. Get them dead. Yep. Ready for the next? Ready. Is Way Down. Way Down is a magic card. It's a sorcery. It costs a single black. As an additional cost to cast the spell, we've seen this before, you have to exile a creature card from your own graveyard. Yes, you do. But for a single black, target creature gets minus three, minus three That's... until end of turn. Uh, in You know what deck I think is going to love this in Arena Pulper is Rats. Rats is... This is there's a lot of reasons that Rats wants this, and I think you're 100 percent correct. It's an odd casting cost, it is. which if you haven't watched our primer, our pauper primers before for Arena, um, the big thing that you have to keep aware of is you have to at least have a few copies of odd costed cards, especially cards that cost a single black mana in your Rats deck, because the faster you can start double spelling, mm-hmm. the higher the pressure is, and also you're going to have those odd turns where you cannot cast multiple Rats on your on your three and your five. Yeah. So you want to be able to have that backup card, which I think Supernatural Stamina is still the best one. But this is an awesome removal spell to get something out of your way because it's minus three, minus three is a lot. It really and can be. Of all the decks that draw hate, like creature removal out of an opponent's hand, rats may be the fastest to do it. Yeah. Like I'll take a couple hits from a, glim, a grim, grim Lava Runner. Grim Lava Runner? Something uh, like that. Get to Lava Runner. Get to Lava Runner. I'll take a hit from him a couple times while I figure out a plan to value my way ahead of red. But rats, it's like, oh crap, I got to keep these rats off the board. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's such a critical mass deck. So I think this is very good in the rats deck. I definitely think there are mid range value style decks that want this kind of effect on the cheap. The, the lack of mana is what really makes it good. Yeah. It's really cheap, it's a cost. So I don't know how much something like a Demir Control can take advantage of a card like this, but if you're playing where you're yeah. self-milling or you're electing to draw and discard and you're looting, I think you can take enough advantage that this could probably be a two-of cheap removal spell in your deck. 
Yeah, I can see those decks loving this, actually. But that's or, just is there Ochi. an aristocrat style deck? There hasn't been a big breakout one. There, I think it's missing some. Lot, oomph, but... oh, yeah, a lot of those pieces are uncommon, so. I think this is better than a lot of the sacrifice your creature to kill something style cards for that for that particular deck because yeah. it's so good. Because you the problem is you want to run like eight of them, and then it's like crap, eight's too many, and then you end up with too few, and you're like crap, this isn't enough. But now if you're starting to sack and get your value engine on this for a single mana lets you cast your like three mana spell on fourth turn and you get tons of value that way and yeah. double and i keep mentioning double spelling just because it's so important in pauper Absolutely. especially arena pauper but and then you brought up like if you have some of the like bone splinter style cards for mm -hmm. two black you can use that same creature that you bone splintered with to exile with way down so it's double spelling and using the same creature as the additional cost which is very nice yeah it's amazing imagine like you have like a black cat and they have to discard a card at random in the middle of all of that. Yeah. Where you have uh, Doom to send her, and you have a two-two zombie now, and their opponent, your opponent's board's clear. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good ways that the the the, the decks that want it can take a lot of advantage of it. Totally agree. All right. Next up is Code Spell Cleric. Yeah, Code Spell Cleric is an interesting one. Um, um, <laughs> I, I I think it's pretty good. It's cheap. And the turn where you get to go Soul Warden in a Code Spell Cleric feels pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a 1-1 one, one for 1 with Vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, if it was the second spell you cast, you get to put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. Yeah. That's cheap. That's yep. a cheap rate. You know what's really good? Savannah Lions. Yep. With an extra power, or an extra point of toughness and Vigilance. And Vigilance, yeah. Yep. No power creep magic, though. No, not at all. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah, it's really good the uh, white decks in uh pauper either generally the hexproof style uh played for their enchantments or they're this style of like creature ama amassing or very yeah. fast style so like being able to go turn one soul warden go turn two healer's hawk code spell cleric put a counter on my soul warden or my healer's hawk attack you is a yeah. tough line to follow up in arena pauper like you're gonna have trouble, and then the counter has a lot of implications because you don't your minus one minus one effects aren't nearly as good. Yeah. So it's like, oh, man, like I can't like I'm gonna wipe two of the creatures, but the giant healer's hawk's still gonna be beating me down. That's really good. Rough, yeah. Really good. There's not much convoke, but you can if you're gonna play a couple convoke spells as your top end. Another card that can convoke really easy. Yeah, like it costs. Nothing. It's mana neutral for Convoke, yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Next up is Brian Barrow Intruder. Yeah, this one's a tough card to evaluate, but one that I think is worth mentioning. It's a single blue for 1-2 with Flash. And we've seen this a lot now. Zillaport Cutthroat has it. Um, before that, we had the Fairy Duelist that had it with Flying. When it enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 2, minus 0 until end of turn. Yeah, I mean... This can easily take out that, you know, the creatures that we're talking about, like little two ones that are attacking early. Yep, exactly. It's anything that can kind of get big or is attacking above rate. You can add to the board. You can have an effect that does something, and you can also hold back your mana if you need to do something else or cast this thing. At least you're adding yeah. to the board or staving off an attack. It's not bad. It doesn't really have a home yet. For anything, because there's no real blue tempo deck. If there's a blue tempo deck, it tends to be like the Flyers style deck, where it's using winged words to draw cards. Um, mm -hmm. But this is still not bad in like a cheap board presence style deck. So it's it's a tough one to evaluate, but it's so cheap. You're getting a one two for one with Flash. That I, in and of itself yeah. is not bad. Not at all. I'll take out your Firebrand that's attacking me. Like it, there's some good implications this thing can do just with the one two Flash for one, and then on top of that. The minus two minus zero to an attacker could be like I'll block your firebrand and I'll minus two your get to lava runner. So I take no damage here and I remove a card from your board. Yeah, that's that's a very very solid line that is super cheap. So yep, yep. It, it, the commitment cost is none. It will easily find a home for the decks that are looking to just stave off in the early game. Yep, 
It's one of the tough things to evaluate in Arena Pauper in general is they've never given us Arena Pauper with a sideboard. No, they need to. Like that would be great. I'd love for a just a full one of the like Thursday to Thursday events where it's just a, it's historic Pauper, but they're matches. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, really would. Support that format, <laughs> please. All right, next up, Dogged Pursuit. Yes, I call this copies five and six of uh, IGI. <laughs> I've got an inheritance, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's a three and a black enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. Yep. So I think this is interesting because IGI is the beginning of the turn. Or Correct. you got to go turn cycle right before you get it, yeah. So this, yeah, this, it hits immediately. And yep. it gives you a separate instance of life gain, which is... You know, that can be pretty important in the mono black life gain deck. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's like drain and gain style decks that are taking advantage of the uh, the giant vampire. Yeah. Whose name I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, there's several, honestly. Whenever you whenever you gain a life, your opponent loses a life. Yeah, the four, uh, four for five. That yep. I'm sure we've gone over in multiple pauper. Oh yeah, tons. And then the new one too, the uh, the cleric that's a three two that does it. Yeah, the so decks that are Blight Priest. Blight Priest, yeah. The decks Blight that are Priest. taking Blight Priest and Blood Priest, that's the problem. Yeah. Blood <laughs> Priest. Yeah. Um so there's a lot of cards that there's there is a deck that's built like that and kind of can use that style, and Dogged Pursuit is a nice extra copy. The control decks, Demir Control, Mono Black Control, tend to use it as a, a helpful win condition and way to get back in the game long yeah. term. So this is additional copies. Um, you can mix it up. I think IGI is still a little better because of the sacrifice clause on IGI. Yeah. With the four life swing. Yeah, because that can just close out a game. Yes. This doesn't have that ability, so it's a little bit separate. It's also a little bit um, more expensive than Trespasser's Curse. Mm-hmm. So, but it doesn't. It is always happening. So there is an advantage there. But it feels like if you're if you're like, man, I just would love to have copies five and six of Ill-Gotten Inheritance in my deck. This is your boy. Yep. Absolutely. Next up is Elder Fang Disciple. Elder Fang Disciples, 1-1 one, one for 2. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. I do love a Ravenous Rats. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, it's an it, elf. I don't know how good it's going to be. And I don't... There's the, Here's the thing. With all the uh, remove a creature from your graveyard effects, I think more decks are going to be leaning towards Miasmic Mummy. Which yeah. is where each symmetrical two two that does this. I think each I think decks are going to want that a little bit more than this. But it is ravenous rats as an elf. Mm-hmm. So there's value there. I think I think there is there was elves were one of the tribes that were like we're pretty close on the fence. Uh, like and elves are getting elves are getting a boost uh, with a really nice sorcery in this set. Yep. And you're getting, I think you may have to play your elves with a splash of black more than likely in Arena Pauper because these some of these cards just give you more reach than just playing mono green. They've made that even easier with all the lands we mentioned. Yeah, and then not to mention the uh, the lands where you get to name a color from yeah. Jumpstart. That's there's just a lot of good there's a lot of good mana right now in Pauper. No matter what kind of Pauper you're playing, you have good mana. Yeah, and I think this card's not bad. You can keep recurring it, keep killing. You can use it later for value. You can. Make your opponent discard cards. It's always block, get rid of a card. It's good value. I don't know where it's going to go, if a, a aristocrat-style deck's going to come out of anything, but if it does, that's where this is going. Most likely, yeah. Right. Next up, we have Frostbite. I mean, Frostbite. what more can you say? <laughs> right. You know what it does. It's shock. <laughs> Two damage a target creature or pl- uh, creature or planeswalker. It's almost a shock. What's yeah. the one with spell mastery? I forget the name of that one. I can't uh, if you control three or more snow permanents, however, it can deal three damage. Yeah. So likely your your snow permanents are going to be snow land. Most likely. But there's almost a zero cost for having... If you're playing mono red, I'm going to put in snow mountains. If you're playing dual colors, you use the snow you use the snow duel over the gain of, gain of life duel. And you just have this card, which is a single mana for three. And three is kind of the... In Arena Pauper, it's kind of the line. Creatures that have three toughness generally are a lot better than creatures with two. And if you're evaluating cards for the long game, that's one of the first places you need to look is does it die to a shock? Yeah. Because we have shock, we have pillar of flame. There's a lot of effects that deal two. There's the um, 
the oh. card that gets minus two, minus two, and you gain two life in black. Yeah, moment of craving. Moment of craving. There's like it kind of the line kind of is drawn at two, where two is some of the better removal. For three, you generally have to spend three damage or minus three, minus three effect. You generally are spending two mana in Arena Pauper. Yeah. This is one of the few cards that breaks that rule. Mm-hmm. So it is a very powerful piece of mana, uh, piece of removal that the cost of just simply having the mana be snow based mana is not very high. No, there's almost no reason not to just run snow basics in this format or any format, really. Yep. And now that they're in Arena, I'd be surprised if every format that they were legal, they weren't played. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think that. You can just... I mean, I think the decks that want this are the little bit bigger style blue-red blue, r- blue red spells decks. So they're like the, the like uh, Spellgorger weird decks. Yeah. We're not really looking to play this right away, but I want to play my Spellgorger weird on, weird on three or turn four, leave a mana up for either a Spell Pierce or this Frostbite card, um, depending on what my opponent does, mm-hmm. and then immediately get a counter on my weird, then the next turn untap, go cantrip into cantrip into removal spell attack for like seven. Yeah, that's that's the dream right there. Yeah, that's kind of where Frostbite's going to find a pretty easy home, I think. For sure. All right, next up is Starnheim Courser. Yeah, we were talking about this style of deck earlier. Um, this is a 2-2 two, two flying Pegasus for 3, and it has the ability of... Yeah, and then it has the artifact and enchantment spells you, call, you cast cost one colorless or one generic less to cast. There's no downside whatsoever, like... Nope. Windrake that is just the Transcendent Envoy. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah, Transcendent Envoy uh, on a Windrake. It's a little, the cost of one more is a little bit higher, but if you're going to do the value style decks um, or you're looking to play a little bit longer of a game in the mirror with like your Hexproof style deck, this is going to go a long way because making your Ancestral Mask cost with like if you go turn two on Envoy, turn three Courser. Making your mass cost enough that you can hold up your counter spells. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, you can, you know, keep playing the mask and also keep up the the snakeskin veil. And... Keep snakeskin veil. You can keep up negate, like full negate. Yeah, <laughs> it's impressive how much you can do with this. Can, this card can be pretty backbreaking because, like, yeah, you can. I'm gonna put this on my creature now. Uh, I'm gonna counter it. I'm gonna counter your counter. Um, it's gonna go on. It's gonna attack. I'm gonna try to kill it. I'm going to snakeskin veil it. I did that all in my fourth turn. That's rough. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. That's how you win a game. That's how you win a game right there. That's insane. Yeah, it's not an enchantment itself, so it won't increase the size of the mask, unlike the uh, the envoy. True. But still, I still think it's uh, it's quite a quite a quite a good card. Not necessarily card again. Not necessarily like oh my god, every deck's playing four Starheim Starheim Courser, but the decks it's good in, it's potentially very good. Yeah, the enchantment decks are going to absolutely eat this up, and there's. Quite a few out there. Yeah, no kidding. All right, next up, I absolutely love this card. It's Raven Form. Card sweet. I mean, so again, this is one of those. Uh, the, again, the first half of the card, I'm a big fan of, and then yep. you keep reading it. Yeah, it's two and a two and a blue sorcery. Exile target artifact or creature, Amazing. which is rare in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Its controller creates a 1-1 one, one blue bird creature token with flying. Makes sense. Absolutely. And then it gets foretell. Yep, for a single and, blue. Yep, it kind of literally splits its mana cost. Two of it for foretell, and then a blue later on. Yeah, so you know what's great at common? Swan Song, basically. Yeah, like, it's it's crazy. This is unconditional exile effect. Now, creatures coming back from the graveyard, a lot more common in Arena Pauper. And a lot easier to do than bringing back artifacts and enchantments in normal pauper. Yeah. So exiling here is a huge deal because escape is a like rage hound. You'll see played in arena pauper. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll see some of the cheaper enchantments. I think like Mogus's favor or whatever it's called, the yeah. single black enchantment with escape. Some of those all get played. There's witch's cottage. There's a ton of things that just kind of incidentally recur. So being able to exile is a big deal. Yeah. Like it's the reason you play uh, Obnixilus's Cruelty because it exiles the creature. Yeah, this does it for a single blue and the cost of showing your opponent that you have this. Here's some unconditional removal. Better deal with it. Well, here, like the thing is, you exile it face down for Fortel. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's true too. They don't like all these foretell. You could have like all the foretell cards we've mentioned and exile at the same time. Yep. They just have to hope it's not one of them. Yeah, you got to hope that you're playing be, Behold the... And what's nice about this one is it's in blue, which is the most likely you're going to see because of Behold the Multiverse. Yeah, and so you're just like, all right, cool. Is that them drawing two cards or is that them getting rid of my 4-4? Four, four? Yeah, exactly. It's Crap. so good. Like, the cost of the information is so little in this card because it's just like every deck's going to play Removal and Pauper unless it's a, like a super hyper proactive combo deck like Mask or something. Yeah. Your deck's going to be playing Removal. So there's not much, like, you're not really losing much in that regard, and you have that piece of unconditional removal for them to get a bird? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> have your bird. Yeah, pretty much. Not really. Decks that can get rid of that are just whatever. The the artifact part, not quite as big of a deal? Not too much in Pauper. Like, I mean, this, this card is probably going to have implications across all formats, which is nice, but... Yeah, there could be corner cases. Like, if yeah. there's an energy deck running around, I don't know mm-hmm. if the Puzzle Knots have made it into a pauper yet, but we'll find out next time there's a there's, big event. Yeah, there's always going to be somebody who's playing some kind of little value thing. I mentioned Ginger Brood earlier, but get rid of Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. Get your, get your Ginger Brood with, like, a random enchantment on there. Get it out of here. Yeah. All right, so the final card, Scorn Effigy. It's an artifact, but it's also a creature, so... It is. It is a 2-3 three for 3. Not very good rate, but it does have foretell for the very bizarre cost of 0. Yeah, like... I freaking love this. Like, it's so strange. And I don't know as though it's going to find a home here in Arena Pauper so much, because there's no, like, storm, or anything that takes advantage of multiple creatures entering the battlefield as much as like maybe a soul warden, but I don't know as though you're going to run your scorn effigies in your soul warden deck. Like it, this is definitely more of like the final card we wanted to mention because it could be it could be the biggest dud or the biggest star depending on what deck finds a home for it first. Yeah, like totally. An actual pauper storm may love this. We don't know. Don't know. Like, but there's a there's a chance. Like, there's a chance that there's going to be a build out there that's looking to just like load up a bunch of cheaper spells, including free ones that are two threes as well, and then mm-hmm. just go and like go crazy from there. So, absolutely. Yeah, if you can take is... advantage of creatures entering the battlefield and something happens, like if you have an engine that when a creature enters the battlefield, something something good happens. That's yeah. kind of where this card shines. Yeah, like it's just. There's there's very little extra cost to it, so I mean you pay two and you drop it a turn later, like yeah. no harm no foul. Nope, and two threes again. We talked about the line in Arena Pauper. Three toughness is that line. Yeah, so this really like this shuts down a lot of things. It does, and you get to scare your opponent. And be like, what in the world are they going to foretell? Well, I mean, you definitely scare them if they're a crow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Hmm. And it's got great flavor text too. Oh, I mean, I just I love a lot of the scarecrow arts in general, but this one just is extra creepy. And the runes on the stones right next to it, just it's all really good. Yeah, totally. But I think those are those are likely the cards that are you'll see or have a chance at being tested and brewed with for yeah. Arena Pauper. There's a couple other ones like I mentioned the Elf Sorcery. I just don't know if elves are quite there yet. If they end up becoming there, that card's 100 percent going to get played. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty good. Um, I brought it up on the Instagram and Facebook, which, if you're not following us there, you should be. Yeah, you should. Superliminal Films. Yep. Superliminal FLM on the Twitter. Yes. I but Superliminal Films everywhere else. Yep, including the website, <laughs> which is to your right, depending on if you're holding your phone or watching this on a screen properly. I don't know. I don't, I don't tell you how to watch things. You watch, I mean, it's just our faces for the most part. You watch them tiny. It's true. Maybe Normally our... you don't see these. No, we try to hide these away like, from the doing? world. What am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Who, who knows? This is my but, idea. Yeah, we put these out for you every Thursday. Um, so check us out. Keep coming back if you do. Thank you so much for doing that. Let us know in the comments, what did we miss? What do you think is yeah. good? What, uh, what have we overlooked uh, tragically and to our, to our dismay? Because I think we have in the past. I think Tamiya's Epiphany was the biggest one I've ever missed. Oh, Not yeah. that that could be a ton of play, but it does get play. Yeah, it did. Mm-hmm. Still. 
Yeah. So um, let us know. Let us know what you're excited about for Pauper, especially Arena Pauper, because we're always looking to do that. And we do that over on a lot on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Superliminal Films. So definitely check us out. We're there every Sunday playing Arena. Some Stripe, usually limited. But when there's Pauper afoot, you know we're playing it. Absolutely. So you can find us there. Give us a follow. You'll know when we go up. Um, so that helps. And on YouTube here, you can ring the bell and subscribe, and you'll know when we put more content up. Absolutely. But we'll stop plugging at you now and let you get along with your week. So enjoy the weekend. Enjoy call time. Enjoy pauper. That's what's important. Play more games. Yes. Wait, that's not us. Cast more spells. <laughs>